So the basis for the third marriage trap starts when your average 13 year old arrives at high school wanting to make a name for himself, wanting to earn respect and to find a place for himself in this whole new environment that he finds himself in. And what he's likely to do is as he gets there and looks around the, the other boys, the other young men who are in that high school, he's likely to make a number of observations. The first observation he's likely to make is that the person who's dating the prettiest girl in school is likely to be respected, is, is to occupy a pretty high uh, place on the ladder or the hierarchy within that school. The second observation he's likely to make is that the guy who rocks up at school in a, a Maserati or a BMW is likely to be respected and, uh, and again is likely to have status on this ladder. The third ob observation he's likely to make is that the guy who can bench press 150 kilos uh, is powerful, is strong, is muscular, uh, is also likely to, to be high on the, on the totem pole. And so what he's learned there is that the holy trinity of ladder promotion is sex, money and power. And, um, and that basis is already being formed at that very young age. What he's also likely to know then is that the kid who's getting his uh, head shoved down the toilet at lunchtime is likely to be the one who's emotional, who's, who's weak, who, uh, who's unattractive, uh, and someone who uh, opens himself up to humiliation or is unable to fend off attack or is, uh, ex expresses themselves more emotionally or in a way that could be perceived to be feminine. So it becomes clear that being at the top of the ladder is a really good place to be, being at the bottom of the ladder is a really horrible place to be, and, it, and it's a place that you really want to avoid at all cost. And so through this experience, the, uh, the, even as a young, young boy, he learns that in order to survive in, in his environment, that what he needs to do is he needs to develop a mask, he needs to protect himself from, the, uh, from showing emotion, and in particular, he needs to pre um, prevent himself from showing fear or sadness, that those two are, are keys to, um, to being demoted on the ladder, and he needs to avoid situations in which he could experience humiliation. Because again, those are setups, um, and they take him closer, closer down to the bottom of the ladder and getting his head shoved down the toilet. And it's not great being lower on the ladder, but it's really terrible to be right at the bottom of the ladder. And, um, and so he's likely to learn that you can't trust uh, other people around you because they can use information that they hear against you in their quest to go up the ladder. And so he's going to learn how to live in a, in a pretty isolated way a lot of the time. A 13-year-old girl arriving at high school will have quite a different experience. What she's likely to, to uh, be on her mind is that she wants to fit in, she wants to be social, she wants to be connected. And so she's more likely to view high school a bit more like the circle or this lifeboat. And everyone wants to get into the circle, want to be part of the group. And so it's really essential that you fit in with people around you and that you build connections and that you uh, resolve, resolve issues. And, and one of the ways that you do that is that you talk with each other, that you share your feelings, that you, you create bonds and connections. And, um, and you work pretty hard at that. If you really want to upset you know, a 13-year-old girl, take away her phone. Uh, I have personal experience with vouchers for that. And so this, um, by maintaining these relationships, women uh, assure themselves of a place in the circle. And generally, the people at the center of the circle are the people with the best connection, uh, who are able to facilitate and uh, connect different people. And so they become power brokers within that thing as a result of their relational knowledge and, and their ability to connect and, and uh, act as a hub to bring other people together. And so women learn at a, you know, at a very young age, it's really happening before high school, that uh, to take care of the interests of others, to take care of the feelings of others, and that by doing that, you assure yourself of uh, a place in the community and, uh, you know, and it, it brings you closer together. Now, there's a couple of other ways that you can shift closer to the circle. For instance, if one of the girls gets cancer or you know, she's really sick or, or some, you know, has some catastrophe or disaster, then the tendency will be for the other girl to gather around her because they want to be seen as loving and caring. And so when you experience pain or loss or sadness, uh, the experience will tend to be that you'll go to the middle of the circle. And uh, the flip side of that is that if you, uh, for instance, do something that's really terrible, so if you, you, know, if you were to sleep with a boyfriend of the girl who's got cancer, uh, the next day you arrive at school, the other, the other girls will be, would be wanting to push you out of the circle. And the way that they would be most likely to do that, so the most powerful sanction that they would likely apply to you, would be to, uh, would be to stop talking to you. That they would just pretend that you didn't exist 
and and so you would be outside of the circle. And again, these rules are, are mostly unwritten, but they 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 are pretty uh, clear uh, across you know broadly speaking Western culture and um, and other cultures as well. So we have these two different assumptions that are running uh, similarly side by side uh, all along the way. And so then what happens at some point in time is that a uh, boy meets girl, uh, generally it goes more like girl meets boy, so a girl sees a, a boy that she's interested in, you know, part of the circle, you, talk, you know, girls are talking about boys a long time before uh, boys are really aware of girls. And um, so they send about 150 signals, you know, to, to this boy that she's interested and around about 138 the guy notices, you know, thinks it's his idea, so he moves over to, to be in connection, to, to shift himself closer to this girl. And at that point in time, uh, his brain freezes, you know, because he's really excited, but he's also facing this risk of humiliation if she rejects him. And so uh, his brain freezes and he can't talk, so he's down there going, uh, uh, uh. And, um, and the woman is having a slightly similar experience, you know, she's really excited because there's this opportunity to create this really special connection, this circle with just the two of them. Um, and so she's very excited and her brain gets overexcited and so then she can't stop talking and so what she's likely to do is to start off with um, by doing appreciation and bonding uh, techniques that she will use within the circle. So she might say something like, wow, you know, you're so amazing, you know, I just loved how you played the rugby or the football and, you know, you were so brave and, and she, she's laying out all these appreciations and these bonding kind of things very normal behavior within the circle internally she's probably yelling at herself to shut up stop talking but from the guy's point of view that he's actually having a very novel experience for him in that uh, i don't know how many of you have seen a bunch of guys standing around saying wow you know bob that that lawn you mowed that was just amazing you know just totally pristine and it was great and you get the edges you know done so well and and that shirt i really love how it looks on you it really you know shows off your chest i think the woman must think that looks fantastic it's not normal, normal behavior that you would see even adult men uh, engaging in, let alone uh, high schoolers. And so for the guy, he's receiving all of this, this appreciation and, um, and it feels really good. Uh, one of the few times that guys will actually experience appreciation is when they are doing something like they're scoring the winning try and guys will literally break bones in order to, um, in order to try and get that, uh, that applause and that success. But it's, a, it's, not, it's a pretty thin picking for most guys. So this woman's giving, saying all these wonderful things about them, this feels really nice, and so he wants to hang around her. It feels really good for him to be in a space with her where she's saying all these wonderful things about him. And um, so he's hanging out with her, and so the woman, you know, the girl feels really connected, and this feels really nice, and so suddenly it feels like she's in this special circle that she's not gonna get kicked out of, and it just feels really easy. And, um, and even within her broader circle, all of the other girls are interested because romance is a, you know, is a, you know, the fairy tale and the princess and the prince, that's all really exciting stuff. So she moves more to the center in her own circle and that feels really great. The guy's shifting up the ladder, she's getting all this praise from her and the other guys are saying, oh, you know, you've at least got a woman who's kind of interested enough to look at you. So he's getting that status boost there. So it feels like he's at the top of the ladder, she's in the center of the circle and this feels really fantastic. So at this point in time, they decide as it goes through that, wow, this is fantastic, you know, we should totally be together. And, um, and so we're gonna fast forward a little bit till they're, they're getting married um, or, you know, in a committed relationship. And um, at that point in time, a, uh, the assumption that they're both carrying is this feels fantastic, we should get together so we can have this for the rest of our lives. And at that point in time that the commitment is really made and they're in that relationship, a really important shift takes place that, uh, on the guy's part. And the, um, the guy basically says, we've, we've, we've shifted up the ladder, you know, we're at the, the top of this ladder, and um, so we've, we've ticked the sex box. You know, guys don't get extra points for having a good relationship with their partner. We like having a good relationship, but you, you know, you very seldom see a bunch of guys sitting around in a pub saying, wow, you know, so how's your relationship, you know, going and how emotionally connected are you with your, your partner? It's not normally something that most guys will sit around, um, sit around talking about. So they, um, uh, so that, you know, the guy makes a shift, so, you know, he's, he's ticked the sex box. So if he wants to continue shifting up the ladder or maintaining his place and taking care of his princess in the way that, you know, he wants to, to, you know, the way that he feels that she deserves, then the shift for him is really to start, um, 
you know, is to do something else. And so he got money and power. And so the obvious one and for most guys tends to be uh, to focus on money, you know, on power, on his job. And so his focus at that point in time shifts towards prioritizing, moving up the ladder uh, and really focusing on his career as a way of expressing his love and devotion and care for, for this woman that he loves. And so, um, and the woman has no idea that the shift has taken place. So the guy's psychological energies make this, make this transition or this shift. So, and at that, that point in time, something kind of happens in the relationship. So, and it kind of goes a little bit like this. So the guy comes home from work the one day, you know, early in the relationship, and um, you know, his wife's uh, in tears, and she's got this big cut on her leg, and the guy's like, babe, you know, what happened? You know, what's, what's going on? And she says, oh, I was taking the rubbish out this morning, and this, uh, you know, there was some glass in it that wasn't wrapped up, and, and when it brushed past my leg, uh, you know, it cut my, cut my leg. And the guy's thinking, crap, you know, because uh, it was his job to put the rubbish out, and so, and he also put the glass away and didn't wrap it up, because when he carries the rubbish out, he carries it out at the end of his arm like that, not brushing against his body at all, and if the garbage guy gets cut, who cares? Um, so he feels really bad, you know, because he's screwed up. And so he's, you know, he's really sorry. And I'm, I'm, babe, I'm so sorry. You know, he's apologizing. He takes it to the doctor. You know, is there anything I can do? And he's doing all these things to try and placate because uh, he's screwed up. And, um, and the question that the woman is really asking, uh, because she's not surprised that he's screwed up in a relationship. She's got lots of experience with relationships with friends where they hurt each other, they let each other down. And then the question you need to resolve is, do you still care about me? Is our uh, a relational connection okay um, are we still both in the circle so that's what she's trying to find out from him uh, unconsciously and um, and so what she sees from his demonstration of care and concern and he's clearly upset um, is that hey you know that's great you know he still cares about me and um, and so she might tell her friends and uh, you know say oh my gosh you know he was so upset and he, you know he, he, you know he was crying he felt so bad and his friends will be saying, oh, you know, he's such a sweet man. And every, from the girl's point of view, everything's fine. This will work really well. And the woman has been validated in an assumption uh, that's going to get into a, her into a lot of trouble. The assumption is, is that by talking about things, that she has made the relationship better. What she's not aware of is that in most cases, what's happened for the guy on the ladder is that he's gone down the ladder. And the woman doesn't know this because she's not even thinking about the ladder because she thinks in terms of the circle. So the guy's, you know, he's screwed up, his you know, partner has a permanent scar, you know, he's an inconsiderate asshole. And so, you know, he's gone down the ladder, he's a bad guy. So uh, at that point in time, the, uh, but the woman doesn't know this, nothing's really talked about, and the woman's really happy, this works really well. And so what she's learned is that when there's an issue in the relationship, what I need to do is talk to my partner about it and then things will get better and then we'll know that we're in a circle and everything's going to be fine. So over the course of the relationship over the next couple of years is whenever there's an issue in the relationship, the woman will say, honey, we need to talk and they will talk about it and the guy will acknowledge that he's wrong and, you know, and, um, and the, the woman will feel great, we're making things better. And... Um, uh, and she will think that the relationship is improving. But in most cases, what will be happening is that the guy will be taking hits, that he'll be c coming down the ladder. The message that he will be getting is that you are not measuring up in some way. And, um, uh, and he's most likely to, uh, to pay a lot of attention to those negative messages. And often it can be reinforced if the woman is forgetting to tell him about all the things that he is doing right uh, in the relationship. So what happens at some point in time is the guy gets down to a point on the ladder, so shifting down the ladder progressively till he gets to a point which may be sort of roughly where he was when he met his partner. And at this point in time, he doesn't want to go down any further. It's one of the problems with uh, dating Brad Pitt is that Brad Pitt doesn't want to go down the ladder because his, you know, he starts up pretty high. And so, you know, he's going to make a fuss before he goes down very far. That may be completely unfair to Brad Pitt, but, you know, that's uh, the um, stereotype I'm going to go with. Uh, but he gets down to this point in the ladder, he doesn't want to go any lower. And by this point in time, he's really smart. So he's figured out that these problems always start with this conversation that, uh, that start with, honey, we need to talk. So he's got this brilliant theory, and the brilliant theory says, what we need to do is avoid having those conversations, because if you're going to have a conflict, and you know this from the ladder, if, if there's a conflict on the ladder, you know, someone's got to die. Someone's got to go down the ladder. And so what he's been doing because of his love for his partner is... Uh, is, is voluntarily taking the hit and going down the relationship. So even if she, he thinks she's being kind of petty or making a fuss about nothing, he's not going to point that out 
he's going to take the hit and go down. But at this point in time, he doesn't want to go down anymore. So his next strategy is saying, well, this is really simple. We just need to avoid those conversations and then things will be fine. And so the next time his partner says, you know, honey, we need to, uh, to talk, he says, oh, oh look, I'm, I'm really busy. You know, I need to get this tax return done or I need to, you know, stand that corner of the deck. And so he rushes off to go and do all of this, uh, this stuff. And he's, he's working really hard to avoid the conversation. The problem is his partner's not an idiot. And she pretty quickly figures out that, uh, that, you know, that he's avoiding and that he's not talking to her. And this is where things start going really badly from the woman's point of view because she is sitting there thinking, what the hell is happening? You know, I, um, I haven't slept with his buddy. You know, what, what is going wrong here? And, um, and so she gets really distressed by this. She feels like, oh my gosh, you know, he's completely cut me out of the circle. You know, he's going to divorce me. You know, this is, this is a catastrophe that he's not talking to me. So she gets more and more upset, more and more emotional, you know, saying, what's going on? What's going on? You know, what's the big fuss? Why aren't you talking to me? And the guy is bewildered and frustrated because he's trying to make the relationship better by avoiding these com uh, conflicts. He doesn't want to complain about it. He wants to have this nice, smooth, peaceful, kind of connected relationship where, you know, where there's no fighting or conflict because conflict's always a bad thing on the ladder. You know, someone's going to get hurt and he doesn't want either of them to get hurt. So, um... But the woman just keeps pushing it and pushing it and pushing it because she's desperate, you know, she's terrified that she's be, been kicked out of the ladder and that the whole relationship is, is over. And she's likely to be saying something along the lines of, you know, what have I done? That, you know, what's the issue? There must be something wrong because you're not talking to me. Until at some point in time, in desperation, the guy says something like, oh, for God's sake, you know, we've had meatloaf. You know, he's trying to think of anything to get her off his back. So he says, oh, you know, we've had meatloaf for three nights in a row or you know, and I'm sick of your mother coming over and, you know, we haven't had sex for two weeks. And so at this point in time, the, the woman is thinking, thank God, which is very strange from the guy's point of view, because she's sitting there saying, oh, all right, now I know what the problem is in the relationship is, and I have 20 or 30 years of experience at, at fixing problems in a relationship, so um, I'm going to start working really hard to fix these issues in the relationship. And so she's sitting there and saying, you know, we're right. You know, I have been kind of lazy with the cooking and, you know, my, my mum has been coming over and, you know, he's right. You know, I read in Cosmo, men like to have sex at least three or four times a week in order to feel really happy. So, yep, he's right. And so she says, great, fantastic. I'm going to start working on the relationship. So she signs up for some Italian cooking classes. And, you know, so the guy comes home, you know, the, the next night and there's a candle lit meal on the table and you know afterwards uh, you know she takes him upstairs and she's got some new lingerie and you know does you know all the kind of things he, he's ever wanted and the guy's sort of thinking wow you know this is completely amazing and um and basically what's happened is he's sort of sitting there thinking i finally figured the woman out treat him mean keep him keen you know when i was trying to be nice to her all of the time you know that didn't work at all but you know when i started complaining at her suddenly you know she actually starts treating me nice and she gets off my back and there was no complaining so the guy feels like he's a genius he's finally figured out woman he's really happy work's going pretty good and so he goes to work the next day with a bit of a you know spring in his step and um he's on top of the world um the woman's feeling pretty good because he was obviously happy so you know that's all good and what she's waiting for now is um is for him to respond because you see in the circle there's an unwritten rule called reciprocity and reciprocity says you know i'll do something nice for you and it's an unwritten rule but it's a very real rule which says you know when i do something nice for you you're going to respond by by doing something nice for me so you can come and sit with us um, but you aren't going to invite us to that party on friday and if you don't invite us to the party then you're sure as heck not sitting here on monday and um and so the woman's waiting for him to be more connected, to take her, you know, for romantic walks, you know, to give her a back massage, you know, to do those kind of things. And so she's waiting for this. The guy had no idea about this because this law does not operate in the, um, on the ladder. So if you bring a Coke to the captain of the first 15 the one week, he doesn't bring you a Coke the next, next week because he's the man. And um, he's, you know, kind of entitled to that. So, um, so the guy's just sort of thinking, this is really great. He's finally organized his, his woman and uh, he's concentrating on his work. You know, he still loves his partner. Everything's going fantastic and she's not complaining anymore. So life is good. And the woman is kind of feeling frustrated and waiting and, you know, sort of when the heck is he going to kind of come through and deliver. And, um, and, so, and so she's shifting between trying to do stuff and then kind of feeling negative and resentful and complaining at him. But he's now got this brilliant strategy. So if she complains at him, he complains back at her. And so, you know, they get into this power struggle here 
And, um, and the guy, you know, still loves his partner. He's really just using us as a strategy to try and minimize conflict by just kind of equalizing with her. And the woman starts feeling incredibly frustrated and disappointed because, you know, she, what she's really wanting is for him to be connected and she's working really hard and he's just not accepting it and not responding. And so now she's talking to her friends and like, oh my God, you know, I, I, I went there and, you know, I did all these kind of things for him in bed and, you know, he didn't even wait to see if I got off and, you know, and his friends are sitting there saying, what a pig. And, um, and so there's this real kind of sense of negativity that's coming into the relationship. Now, for most of this, the guy is largely oblivious because at the moment, his focus in the relationship is working really hard because that's how he takes care of the relationship. And maybe by this stage in the relationship, his career is getting better. You know, he, he feels more established and more connected. So over a couple of years, they, they get stuck in this power struggle until eventually something really critical happens. And, and which is basically that the woman's tried and failed and tried and failed. She's trying all these strategies and nothing's really working until eventually she thinks, you know what, he clearly doesn't love me. You know, she's getting that message from her friends. You know, she's tried all these things and if he really loved me, he'd be re uh, he would know what I want. He'd be reciprocating, he'd be talking to me, but he's not doing that. He just keeps fobbing me off and he's complaining about things that are not really that big a deal. And, um, and so maybe he just, he doesn't love me anymore. He doesn't care about me and I'm not in the circle anymore. And then at some point in time, and women are generally pretty persistent, um, but after a couple of years, you know, she gives up. And she says, you know, it's not working here. You know, I'm, I'm with the wrong, you know, I didn't get the prince, I got the frog. And so she gives up. And then at this point in time, something critical happens. She stops nagging. And from the guy's point of view, he is thinking, fan bloody tastic. This is amazing. We've finally sorted this relationship out. Sure, I don't get sex quite as often as I wanted to, but you know, my career's going really well. So, you know, love my, love my partner, love the kids. Everything's going fantastically. Um, and uh, you know, and the nagging stop was just, just so fantastic. And so, you know, he's feeling really good about the relationship. The woman, on the other hand, is still uh, is living in the house because she's sort of, you know, planning, you know, how do I take care of the kids? When's the right time to leave? And she's still hoping in that time period that her drastic action of not talking will alert him to the fact that there is a critical issue in the relationship. So again, she's creating another window period for him to let him know that bad stuff is happening in the relationship. And if he really loved her, he would, he would get that signal and then he would start recognizing something seriously is wrong and start talking to her and reconnecting and, and coming back into the relationship. The problem is the guy is oblivious to it because when you're on the ladder and someone's not talking to you, there is no issue. Um, if, you know, if no one's yelling at you, then, then you know, there's not a problem, you don't need to address it. And as I say, from his point of view, he loves his partner, he loves his kids, he doesn't actually have a relational issue in this, in this context. So the, um, and so at some point in time, you know, it might be two years, six months, five years, the woman eventually says, there's no hope, it's a good time to exit, and so she gives him a Dear John letter, at which point in time the guy is in crisis. Oh my God, I can't believe that this happened. You know, uh, you know, how can you be leaving me? You know, we've got the kids, you know, uh, where did this come from? We were, you know, on holiday last week and you said you were having a fantastic time. And the woman's like, I was having a fantastic time. I was on holiday. And, um, and so the woman's really disconnected at this stage. The guy's in a big panic, doesn't know what to do, uh, feels completely blindsided. And often as a counselor, that's when I tend to see people. So um, I'm, I imagine at this point in time you may be feeling horribly depressed. Uh, the fact is that there's a relatively simple strategy to, uh, to avoid a, a lot of this. And it really starts back at the, top of the, uh, at the top of the ladder. So when the couple is in this new relationship and he comes home, he's screwed up um, and you know, she's got the cut on his leg and he does all of these things that the woman wants him to do. At that point in time, if the woman that night had been practicing, you know, the appreciation dialogue that they teach you in Imago uh, relationship therapy, and, you know, had said something like, you know, honey, one of the things that I appreciate about you today is that when you came home, you were so caring, you were so loving, and you, it really made me feel like you cared about me, that you loved me, and, um, and that just made me feel really secure. And I was, I was just telling myself what a fantastic man you are, and that, you know, I chose the right person to be with. Now, from the guy's point of view, this would be completely bizarre to him because he's screwed up. He, you know, he's expecting to be kicked and you know, kicked while he's down and tossed down the ladder. But what he's experiencing is love and connection and mercy from his partner. And he's going to be sitting there thinking, my God, I just chose the most amazing, fantastic, incredible woman in the whole world. He doesn't go down the ladder. 
He is reconnected to his partner and he's also educated through this process about what his partner wanted from him because he didn't know that. Um, so that process of appreciation is a very simple and powerful way that, that helps this couple stay connected. And so by, uh, by shifting from the honey we need to talk about problems to honey I want to tell you what I appreciate about you. The woman is essentially educating him into the value and the ways to be successful in connection. Uh, and she's essentially teaching him how he can continue to stay at the top of the ladder. Um, and then for the, uh, so that's the tip for the woman. For the guys, the thing that's really essential is that they would turn around and um, that they would uh, recognize that for women, the, when, the, when a woman stops talking to you, you're in serious trouble. When a woman is expressing emotion to you, what she's wanting to do is she's uh, expressing the importance of the relationship. So when a guy hears a woman in distress uh, and expressing her distress about the relationship towards him, what she's actually saying is that you are incredibly important to me and I need you to be connected to me. And if a guy listens with that paradigm on, A, it is incredibly affirming because even when a woman is really upset, what she's saying is I love you, I care about you, that's why I'm so upset. And, um, and so he doesn't need to do anything. He can, it, by, simply by being present, uh, which for a guy counts as not doing anything, um, by being present and listening and hearing how important he is, he can, um, he can then stay emotionally connected, which will mean that he will be being successful. So for guys, it's really recognizing that the movement uh, in, when a woman is in distress is really to move towards her, not to accept blame but to understand and, uh, and hear the importance of the relationship. That underneath the complaint or the nagging or the distress is, um, is a desire for connection. And when a guy can listen with that particular paradigm in mind, then what happens is he hears that um, under the thing is like, you know, I want to know that I matter to you. I want to know that you care about me. I want to know that um, when stuff goes wrong that you'll protect me. And, um, and when a guy can really get that, um, and can communicate that that he, you know, that he does love his partner, that he does care about her, and um, uh, and do that. Then what that does is that creates a lot of security for the woman, so she's less likely to nag, and um, and then you can en enjoy that kind of warm, fuzzy, connected, connected state. And that it actually does require some intentional work, um, that it doesn't just happen.